Right. We have been together for so long each night. I want to take a minute. I sent out a, I sent out a um, one call the other day, and I thank God for the response of each of you. Uh, nobody called me fussing about why you remind us of my expectation moment, but instead, our numbers are picked back up. I don't want anybody to take for granted the benefit of what's going on as we study the Word of God. And likewise, I still implore each of us to invite somebody to join us on expectation moment every night, particularly if we just did in reach, if we, if we did in reach in our church. I think we'd be doing very well. So I'm gra grateful for tonight. I'm grateful for the, the, the devotion. I'm grateful for the opportunity God's given us to study his word one more night. We're going to pick up tonight here in the book of um, Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, other night, on Wednesday night when we were together, um, we talked about how this 12th chapter uh, gives uh, how we walk out the faith that is that we have seen highlighted in chapter 11. Remember, chapter 11 brought about the, re the definition of faith and then gave us a long uh, series of, of individuals who live by faith, who are victorious in faith, who persevered through faith, um, and, and again, who ultimately are victorious in faith. And so chapter 12 kind of begins us from a practical perspective, what we should do. And when chapter 12, verse 1 starts out with the word, well, for in other words, in light of these things, seeing that we are compassed with a great cloud of witnesses, those who um, who are who have who have who are, who who have done these things, who who can we can stand and look at them as witnesses. You know, when you go to court, um, the person who goes up on the stands and testifies as to what they endured or what they saw, or what they observed. Those are witnesses. The witnesses that outline in chapter eleven are individuals who, as a result of their faith walk, uh, testified of uh, what God's great power is able to do in the midst of those, in, in the lives of those who actually have, who have faith in him. And so he says that we should you know, lay aside every weight. We talk about that. That we should um, run with patience the race that is set before us. That we should look into Jesus. So he does three things. Lay aside every weight and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We should look into Jesus to often finish by faith. That's three things. Um, and consider him, verse 3, that's five. Consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, may she be weird and faint in minds. In other words, verse three says this. Sometimes we don't want to do nothing that somebody had done. Jesus already did it. And so we, we, we should be inspired and encouraged that Jesus did it. And because he's with us, we can take comfort in that and also know that our race, our victory is, 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 is assured as his race and his victory was. Verse two lets us know that he endured the, the, the suffering of the cross because the joy that was set before him, the outcome, he despised the shame. In other words, Jesus didn't like to say he despised it, yet he continued the work because of the joy set before him. And then and, and set down the right hand of the throne of God. That means that Jesus received glory um, after what he went through. He came, came from glory, suffered in this world, and went, returned to the glory of God, returned to glory with God. Now, um, in verse three says, we got to keep that in mind and not give up. Now, verse four is what we're going to pick up tonight. He says, ye have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. He says, now don't grow weary and faint in your minds, first of all, because as you keep your eyes on Jesus, you see the perfect example of endurance and patience and ultimately his glorification. You see the outcome. He says, but now I just want to remind you, you haven't been through that much because somebody said, but I've been through a lot. No, he says, you had you have not resisted the blood. You have not shed blood uh, through your struggle against sin. That's it. Jesus shed blood to be for us to be victorious over sin. Jesus' death and the shedding of his precious blood paid the price for our sins. So then he's saying, Jesus did it, but don't you think you've done more than Jesus? Because you have not done what Jesus did, and that is shed blood striving against sin. So he reminds us that. So before somebody can say, oh, I've been through that. I've been through a lot. He reminds us that Jesus went through what we went through, but he went through more. Verse 5. And I'm going to slow down on this one. He says, now, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. He said that was something that was commonplace um, in, 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 in the Hebrew world. It was commonplace in Judaism that somebody um, would, would exhort children, hey, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou rebuked of him. That was that was a common um statement, an exhortation that was made when you when people would be chastened to have trouble and difficult to have trials, that they were to not despise and not be angry about the chastening of the Lord. And they shouldn't be grow weary or faint. Like I give up when they are, are rebuked of him. He says you've forgotten that. And because some of them remember that these individuals were thinking about going back because of the trouble they were in. 
the author says don't do it because you remember what you were taught as a child. Don't, 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 um, don't despise the chest of the Lord and don't faint when you are rebuked of him. And he said the same thing the other Some of us said, you know, and I, I, I've had this conversation with folks this week. The number of folks, I just don't feel like being bothered with folk or organized religion, get on my nerves, and this is why folks don't go to church. Let me stop and do a, a, a station break and a public service announcement. Whether you're in church getting and, and having to deal with folk, or you're at your job dealing with folk, or you're at school dealing with folk, wherever you are, you have to deal with folk. And so what we must understand is what we're going through as Christians is not to our destruction, but instead it is for our elevation and our correction and ultimately our, our maturation for us to be mature. And so understanding that context and that concept, uh, we must remember that. When we go through trouble, we can't be like, oh, man, I can't believe this happened to me. We have to understand that maybe the Lord is chastening us. When we have difficulties we and we're rebuked by God, we, we can't say, well, I don't know why God did that. We shouldn't grow faith. We should understand that that is what God is doing. But the question might be, why God got to do me like that? Well, look at verse 6. Verse 6 says the reason why God chastens us, the reason why God rebukes us, is that he loves those he chastens and punishes or scourges every son whom he receives. In other words, what makes us children of God and what demonstrates that is when we go through difficulty, not getting the things which we want or, or having setbacks and having difficulties. God chastens those who he loves. What parent, real good parent, what good parent um, sees their child going astray and doesn't do anything to stop it? No conversation, no verbal chastening, no whipping, nothing. When children are children, we do what we do and, and did what we had to do in order to get them on the right track. That was why we did it. That was whippings and spankings and discipline and scoldings. Why? Because we loved them. We wanted what's best for them. The same thing is true about our relationship with God. Because God loves us, he will do things. And, and sometimes he'll use, just like in the Old Testament, he used other nations to chastise his people. God will allow or use other things to chasten us. But ultimately, we must look at it for what it is. It's not that God has lost control and God has withdrawn. It's that sometimes God does that to chasten us and to rebuke us and to scourge us or even whip us, he says, because he as he takes us as his own, as his children. And so I want to do another station, but when we're you know, in Christ, we got to understand that these things are not for our destruction. Again, we got to understand that these are for our correction and us for us to mature in Christ. Um, that's what we got to keep in mind. And that's what the author is telling uh, the, the Hebrew Christians, and that's what he's telling us today. Remember that. Verse 7 says this. Here's the outcome. If you endure chastening. In other words, if you don't quit, give up, give out, give in. If you endure chastening, he says God deals with you as with sons. That means that not only if you if you deal with the chastening and don't bite back or get, when I say bite back now, I mean, you know, try to walk away. If you deal with chastening, God would then deal with you as sons. What does that mean? Uh, in, in in the New Testament, even in the Old Testament, in the New Testament time to write this letter, uh, a child had the benefits of their father. Like if the father uh, had a lot, the child could know they were they would they would that would be theirs, or they benefited from the father's name or for his resources, or his access to things. He says God would treat us as children as we as sons or children as we endure chastening. In other words, sometimes Christians, because we couldn't endure it, it got we got on our nerves and we went the other direction, we missed out on something God had for us. We miss out on blessings God had for us. We miss out on breakthroughs and deliverance and, and, and other aspects of our life if, because of the fact that we went the wrong direction and didn't endure the chastity. But as we endure chastity, we will experience the same things that a son would experience. And verse 7 says, For what son is he whom the father chastens out? What kind of real kid, what kind of real child belongs to the father that doesn't get chastened sometimes? Verse 8 tells us this. But if you be without chastisement, if you don't want to get chastised, then, and where he says, well, all are partakers, then all of us get. He said, then you are bastards and not sons. I never actually knew that was in there, but I've just read it. You, if, when you don't want to get chastised and you try to just, well, I don't want to be bothered, then you have disconnected yourself from being a son or a daughter of God. When you just say, I ain't doing that, I ain't taking that. Um, and, 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 and it says this in verse 8. We all partakers, all children of God. Let me tell you how it is. Are subject and have at some point endured the chastening of God. None of us can look back and say, well, I ain't had to deal with nothing. No, you did. Maybe you didn't pay attention, which is unfortunate because then you may have missed out on the, the growth process, perhaps. Or maybe God worked it out so you did. But what I'm saying is, don't look at somebody else and say they're not going through something because you don't know what somebody's going through. The other one made very plain. 
all of us are partakers of the chastisement of God. If we can't take it, then we have made ourselves bastards, and that is illegitimate in the in the family or in the in, in children of God. Um, let me read, read this last one, verse nine. He said, "Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh." He said, "We have had biological fathers who have corrected us." That's what he said, and we gave them reverence. He said, "When our parents corrected us." We reverence them. We honor them in, 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 as a result of their reverence. How many of us as children uh, got a whipping and we ain't go out there talking crazy. We, we, we got quiet and that was reverence. What, this is the same thing he said about us when we got children today. We, when we spank them, they, they reverence us. They respect them. A child that doesn't never get a discipline is a child that doesn't have any respect. He says, we have had our fathers of our flesh who corrected us and we gave them reverence. He says, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto God, the Father, Spirits, and live? He said, if you respected your father for his correction, respect God for his correction, because God's correction, as we submit to his correction our lives, we will live. I like that. That's, that's a broad one. When we submit to God's correction our lives, we will live. We will experience what God has for us. We'll live now. We'll, we'll experience, we will experience blessings and breakthroughs as a result of our reverencing God, not just accept or, accept or deal with or endure the chastening, but reverence God because of it. Like, in other words, we're going through, there's a time we say, thank you, God, for what you're taking me through, because I know that there's something that you're doing in me. When we take that position, we find ourselves experiencing life. What does that mean? A broader, deeper life in our relationship with God through Christ. We experience then all of the provision, the power, the peace of God in our lives. And furthermore, we find ourselves on the path and the pattern, the, the path to the eternal life that God has promised us. So enduring the chastening of God and reverencing God as a result of chastening opens new doors for us. It doesn't close doors. It, doesn't, it shouldn't disappoint us and depress us. It should cause us. And I mean, practically, in a, in a carnal sense, yeah, it does. But from a spiritual sense, when we're chastened, we ought to honor God because we know that God is able to do special and even spectacular things in our lives as we submit to him and not submit his authority, but also submit his, his, his chastening and reverence him as a result of it. I'm going to stop there tonight in verse um, um, nine, but I do want us to um, um, understand that as the author opened up in, in Hebrews, giving us the instruction on what we should do, he also has given us instruction on the necessity of not looking at every challenge or every chastening as something, something that hurts, but instead look at it as something that God is doing in our lives. Let us take that into ourselves. Your chastening may come in a variety of ways. It may come through what somebody does or what somebody says, or maybe something that's not happening or something you want that you ain't getting. But whatever method God uses, don't, 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 don't despise it. Endure it and reverence God for it. I'm going to stop tonight at roughly 7.18 p.m. Um, tomorrow, I want to remind everyone we will be having our our closing activity, well, this weekend, I should say, for our vacation Bible school, let me say this. If you have a child, grandchild, great-grandchild, whatever, a neighbor, kid you love, if they have not come, let them come tomorrow for our closing opportunity activities. We're going to have a good time tomorrow. And then Sunday, and I'm going to go ahead and say this, Sunday will be our youth day. But please do not take off because it's still Sunday. There's no off Sundays in St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. There's been no off Sunday in the body of Christ. Come on and let us celebrate our youth. I don't know if y'all knew this, but our theme this this um, vacation Bible schools rejoice in our youth, found in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're rejoicing in our youth. We're in rejoicing in our youth and our youthfulness, quite frankly. And so I say for those who work with the with the, with the vacation Bible school, we felt younger because we did it, and I encourage you to support it by coming out tomorrow uh, and just hanging out in the parking lot. We'll have things like the little food and. And different things on the parking lot tomorrow. And as well, we will be um, Sunday morning. We're going to have a wonderful worship service uh, on our youth Sunday. We're going to have a lot of uh, kids probably be there Sunday. So come on out and just let's have a good time in the Lord. I love each of you. And I want to lay that on you. And I pray that you respond accordingly as a result of that. Let us pray together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, who is our Savior, we love you and we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for these verses you allowed us to cover. We thank you for this time that you allowed us to have with you. And I pray, God, tonight as we uh, close our Bibles, that you let your word remain in our heart. Even as we close our eyes, let our, our, our dreams and our night be full of joy. I pray, God, that you would uh, stir us up tomorrow to come out, celebrate our youth and rejoice in our youth both tomorrow and Sunday. 
I pray, God, we wouldn't take a day off, but instead we take a day on serving you and encouraging those, Lord, that you sent into our midst. I pray, God, tonight that you bless every household, every family, and every individual believer. And beyond that, God, I pray that you would uh, allow your word that we study tonight and all the words over these 866 days that it would get in our, our hands and make us uh, and make us get in our hands and feet that we can serve you better. Let your word get uh, in our hearts that we may be strengthened in our inner man. Let your word, Lord, get in our ears that we can hear your word over the winds of the world. Lord, let your word get on our minds, in our minds, that we might have peace and surpass our understanding and that the fire and darts the same will be quenched. Lord, let your word get on our lips, tongues, vocal cords, lungs, and throat. We may declare your word to a dying world, teach others to ourselves. God, bless us with your presence and your power. God, build a hedge protection around us again that the fire and the same will be quenched. God, let your word speak to our hearts. Let us thank you in all things, knowing this is your will for those of us in Christ Jesus. And let us rejoice every day, every minute, every hour in you. Lord, it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hold on, Zoom. God bless you.